Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. This is your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against the community, bank robbery. A man walks into a bank, calls up a teller, and walks out a few minutes later with thousands of dollars. How was he finally caught? How was he traced? What is the clue to his identity? The answer seems easy. A teller could describe him, that's true. But until 1934, there were about 600 bank robberies every year, most of them successful. Last year, there were 37, most of them unsuccessful. What brought about the change? The explanation that in 1934, Congress gave the FBI jurisdiction over certain banks is not enough. The main clue to work on is still the same, the robber's description. The real explanation lies in the FBI itself, in its organization, in its coverage, in its methods of following up a description, of tracing bank robbers, of hunting down, for example, the two men who began plotting a bank robbery in a small rooming house in a Midwestern city a few months ago. Uh, uh, hi, Artie. Oh, hi, Phil. What time is it? Two o'clock? Was I sleeping that long? Yep. Who are you riding with? Nora. Oh. Cover I'd hit Cincinnati around the 20th. Uh-huh. That'll be the blow-off for us then, kid. Really gonna marry her, huh? Yep. Then what? Then I lay off for a couple of years. That's for squares. So I want it. Where are you gonna take her? Got a spot all picked out, kid. Up in Minnesota. Nothing to do all day but fish and hunt. Yeah, yeah. Cigarettes. On the table. She know about you and larceny? Nope. And she ain't gonna. Hey, what's in this box? Look out for that. Huh? Handle it real easy. It's loaded with dynamite. Real dynamite? Yep. I've been working on it all morning. What for? It's Betsy. What? She's gonna go with us on the bank job tomorrow. I don't get it. You figuring on blowing the joint up? Nope. She just makes the job easy. Look, Gardy. Let me give you the setup. We take Betsy into the bank with us. Uh-huh. I hand one of the tellers a note. Yeah. The note says if he don't hand over all his cash, Betsy will go off in his kisses. And you go with it. No, no. He ain't that brave. He hands over the cash. Look, what's the matter with using a gun? That's for kids. This makes it a nice, quiet, clean operation. Oh, wait a minute. I ain't gonna... Phil, that's how we're gonna do it, see? <laughs> Yeah. 
Marshal Lacan's window is free now. Uh-huh. We can still do it the other way. Uh, just stand by, kid. This will be a cinch. Help you, mister? No, thanks. Okay. <coughs> Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Are you making a withdrawal? Yeah. Well, may I have your passbook, please? I don't think you'll need it. I beg your pardon? Just read this note. What? Read it. If this is some sort of a joke... It's no joke, mister. Don't try any funny stuff. I, I wasn't going to. Betsy here wouldn't like it. She could go off real easy. Well? How, how much do you want? Everything you've got. Singles, too? Everything. Use that money bag, then. Yes, sir. Hurry up. That that thing won't go off by itself, will it? It might. Just keep on moving. Ye- yes, sir. Uh, don't forget them 20s. I was just putting them in. There, that's all the currency. Do you want the silver, too? No, nope. just give me the bag. Yes, sir. Remember what the note said about not giving any alarm. I know. You better let me have that note. Oh, of course. Here. Thanks. So long, Tom. What is the next step in the holdup of a bank? What do the criminals do next? In this case, they stopped a taxi drove to the downtown section of the city and rushed into a busy, crowded department store. That took 15 minutes. Long enough for the bank to notify the local police and the FBI. Long enough for the teller to give a description of the robber. Long enough for both robbers to have disappeared before the FBI and the police could throw a cordon around the department store. 15 minutes and the trail was cold except for a description of the man. But for the agents of the FBI, that was a beginning. That was a lead. That was a clue which would lead to other clues sooner or later. Busy, Jim? No. Come in, Ray. Thanks. Any further developments? No. No trace of either one of them. Well, they probably went in one door of that department store, not another. Yes. Did you get a description of that second man? Not a very good one. The teller gave us a detailed picture of the first one, though. The one with the dynamite? Yes. Was it given to the police? Yes. They're sending out a general alarm. Good. Fowler speaking? Oh, yes, Sergeant. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Want to take this down, Ray? Sure. Black Chevrolet sedan. Four-door. Two-door. Got it. 1940 model. Illinois license plate Y-235. Y-235. Stolen from employee's parking lot. Where? Behind the federal building. Thanks, Sergeant. We'll put that on the teletype right away. That might be the getaway car, Ray. The federal building is in the same block as that department store. Yes. Well, it sounds like we've got work to do. Now there are two descriptions. The description of a man and the description of a car. Now there is more to work on. Now the trail picks up again. But what of the bank robbers? If they have planned this crime well, they know that the stolen car will be reported, will be watched for, will lead to their capture. What do they do? They keep off the main highways, keep clear of the state roads, keep driving swiftly along lonely, unused back roads. Artie. Yeah? Do me a favor, huh? What? Get rid of that box, will you? Betsy? Yeah. <laughs> what for? Well, you've done what you wanted with it. I know. I just feel better having her around. What's the matter? I don't know. Oh, great. Take it easy. No dice, huh? No gas. Look at the needle. Empty. Ah, right. now don't get excited, Phil. This is no problem. One car goes dead on you, so you pick up another one. Where? What's wrong with that one up ahead there? It's coming around the bend. Hey. Come on. Let's hop out quick. 
do we do? Flag him down. I mean, how do we grab the car? Just tell him we want it, that's all. Look, you're not going to use that Betsy routine. Why not? It takes too long. I got a better idea. Well, put that gun away, will you? Give him a wave. I'll go get Betsy. All right, flag him down, will you? Okay. What's the matter? Our car ain't running. Oh. Looks like we got to borrow yours. Huh? Pile out, mister. Oh, no. Oh. I told you to wait till I got Betsy. We got the car, didn't we? When the FBI works on a case, it does not work alone. It has the cooperation of the local police in the city and the surrounding counties and the whole state if necessary. It was a local policeman who found the wounded man and telephoned in his report. Immediately, the special agents checked the engine number of the abandoned car, checked on the man who was shot, found that he had a car, and broadcast a description of it. It wasn't long before that broadcast got results. Waller speaking. Hello, Jim. Ray? Yes. We've traced our men across the line into Missouri. Are you sure? Positive. They held up a farm family in Monticello. Took some food from them and stole their car. How about the car belonging to the man who was shot? They abandoned that. The sheriff who reported it checked the motor number. I see. How badly was that man wounded? I think he'll pull through. I hope so. Ray? Yes? What's the dope on this latest car they took? 1938 Ford. We've got all details on it. An alarm has been sent out. Good. Another small lead. Hmm? This farm family heard the two men quarreling. They talked of splitting up. In that case, one of them would leave the car. Yes. Well, let's send their descriptions to every bus depot, airfield, and railway terminal in, let's see, Missouri, Iowa, and Illinois. That ought to cover it. stops a criminal makes in his flight, the more perfect is the description he leaves behind him. When the bank robbers held up the Missouri farmer, they indirectly presented the FBI with a portrait of themselves. Now the special agents knew what both men looked like, and that knowledge was broadcast throughout the whole region. That's why when a short, dark man of 35 with several moles on the right side of his face boarded an eastbound bus at Fairchild, Iowa... The local police who received the report from the station notified the FBI. The agents immediately checked the schedules, found where the bus would stop next, found when it would stop, and found that they could get there ahead of time. This is a five-minute stop. Five minutes only. They're starting to get off, Jim. Yeah. The bus is pretty crowded. We want to do this as quietly as possible. I know. Jim. I see him. Come on. Just a minute, huh? sir. We'd like to talk to you, please. What for? Just step over here. What is this? We're special agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Ah, uh, you might be able to help us. Well, I will if I can. We're looking for two men who held up a bank on Saturday. Later that day, the same two men shot a farmer over in Eastern County. They stole his car. So? The farmer they shot is still in the hospital. Would you mind letting him look you over? Don't bother. He'd know me. Never mind the frisk. I'm clean. How about money? From the job? Yes. I got my cut. What's your name? Bardo. Phil Bardo. Where's your partner? I don't know. We split up the other side of Fairchild. What was his name? He told me it was Artie Clinton. Where was he headed? He was going to see a dame in Cincinnati. Where in Cincinnati? I don't know. What about that dynamite gadget? You mean Betsy? Betsy? That's what he called it. Oh. He kept that with him, which was okay with me. Well, Jim, at least we can tell Washington headquarters that one of them is in custody. Yes. But Arthur Clinton and Betsy are still at large. That means this case is still pure dynamite. <laughs> momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on Arthur Clinton, bank robber. We'll return to this case in just a moment. Tonight, we'd like to introduce 
two widely separated members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States to each other and to you. Mr. Lytton, we'd like you to know Helen McGrath. And Helen, we want you to meet Mr. Henry C. Lytton, president of The Hub, Henry C. Lytton and Company of Chicago, Illinois. Having attained the remarkable age of 98 years, Mr. Lytton ranks as a senior member of the Equitable Society. Helen is one of our youngest and newest members. Yesterday, she was four months old. Mr. Lytton, when you became an Equitable member in the year 1861, the Society was facing its first great crisis, the financial difficulties brought on by the Civil War. Since then, the Equitable Society has continued to grow and expand through three more wars and seven major depressions. And so, Mr. Lytton, after your 73 years' experience with the Equitable Society, we think you could tell little Helen McGrath that her father showed excellent judgment in making her a member of this society. You can assure her also that as long as she lives, the funds of her society will be put to work in many different ways that will benefit her and her family. Equitable dollars are invested in a farm that help feed her and in industries which provide jobs for her father and millions of other fathers. By serving its members, old and new, the Equitable Society serves America. Now back to the file on Arthur Clinton, bank robber. Almost every criminal has a great sense of loyalty and equality. His loyalty is to himself, and his belief in equality is a belief that if he's caught, his partner should be caught. Fella Bartow told the special agents of the FBI everything he could about his partner. Told them his name was Arthur Clinton, told them he was going to Cincinnati, and told them that he was going there to marry a girl. That was a clue, but Cincinnati is hardly a small town. And like every town these days, the majority of its population is women. Still, it was a clue. A clue to be followed while other agents investigated Arthur Clinton. A clue that later on turned out to be accurate. For Arthur Clinton was in Cincinnati, had married a girl there and was living with her in a quiet hotel. Come here, honey. Honey. Oh. Hello, baby. Hello, darling. Mm. How are you coming with your packing? Oh, I'm afraid I haven't made much progress. I brought the car around, honey. Downstairs. Oh, I'll hurry then. Aunt Mary phoned. Yeah? Mm hmm. She kept me talking for almost half an hour. What she want? Oh, you know. Why was I going away? Why didn't we have a church wedding? <laughs> What'd you tell her? I said we were married by a justice of the peace because that was the way we wanted it. That a girl. Can I get those dresses out for you? Oh, thanks. She wanted to know all about you. Yeah? Did you tell her? Well, just about ten minutes worth. I said you were wonderful, that I was very happy. Well, she wanted to know where we were going on our honeymoon? Of course. I just said we didn't know. We were going to get in the car and travel. Yeah. Get some dresses, honey. Oh, put them on the bed, will you, dear? Okay. You can close that bag there. Sure. You no, know, Aunt Mary really is very sweet, but she still thinks that I'm about 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want us to go away at all. Why not? Oh, on account of my painting, mostly. She thinks I should stay here in Cincinnati and study. Did she tell her you were going to take your paints along with you? Mm, yes. I said I'd get more work done that way than ever. There. Now then, anything else I can do? No. No, I think I'm just about ready, dear. Okay, honey. Oh, well, would you put these shoes in your bag? Yeah, sure. You know, I didn't realize how oh, much... Oh, look out, honey. Huh? Don't touch that little box. Uh, just put the shoes on the other side, huh? Oh, all right. What's in it? The box? Yes. Nothing, really. It's just kind of a good luck thing I carry around. Oh. Well, I'm all packed. The description of a criminal can sometimes lead to his capture. 
but the chances are better if that description can be checked against something else. The FBI had something else, the fingerprints that Arthur Clinton had left on the abandoned cars. The prints checked were those of a man who had been arrested four years back in Jackson, Mississippi. The name was different, but the description was the same. The trail was easier to follow now. It was smoother, and it led straight to Cincinnati, to a marriage bureau, to the family of the girl Clinton had married. But after that, once again, the trail stopped dead. Let's see what we have here now, Ray. Well, there's the description of Clinton. Yes. Description of the girl. Yes. Also some data on the second-hand car he bought in Cincinnati. This girl knows nothing about Clinton's background. Not a thing. Her hmm. family was quite shocked when they heard about him. Too bad. He had told them that he had his own business out west. That a relative had died and left him money. That's how they could afford this long honeymoon. Has the family had any word from them? One postcard. Mail from Chicago. I have it here. Hmm. No indication where they were going. No. They appear to be heading west, though. This car must have Ohio license plates. They went out on the teletype. But Clinton's probably changed them by now. Yes. One possible lead is the girl's interest in painting. Oh? She studied art for a number of years. In fact, she sold one or two watercolors to some local dealers. I see. Her family said she brought her equipment, you know, paints, canvases, along with her. That could be a very good lead, Ray. Um, by the way, did you see this? A wanted notice on Clinton. Yes. Mr. Hoover ordered that for national distribution. In cities, in towns, in villages, wanted notices for Arthur Clinton appeared. And local police were on the lookout. But the FBI did not stop there. At the same time, special agents went to every art material store in the region and left photographs. Two photographs, one of Clinton and one of his wife. Then there was nothing to do but wait. Wait for what had to happen sooner or later. Wait for what finally happened in Duluth, Minnesota. Can I help you, ma'am? Oh, hello. Hello. I, um, I wanted to look at some brushes, please. Sure. There's a whole trayful right here. Oh, thank you. That's a new shipment. Uh, just came in. Yes, I see. I can't say that they're too good. Do you sell paintings? Well, that's not my regular line, you know. Well, uh, I have some watercolors here. I did them mm -hmm. myself. Let's have I a don't look at know. Them. Well, surely. You see, now there's just uh, just the two of them, landscapes. Mm hmm. My husband and I have a camp up in the lake country, and these are local sketches. Mm hmm. Well, uh, not bad. Well, I've sold several canvases back home in Cincinnati. Cincinnati? Mm hmm Would you be interested in them? I... I don't care about the money. It, it's, well... It's just the selling of them. That's very satisfying. Mm hmm Well, why don't you leave them here and I could handle them for you on a commission basis? Oh, that would be wonderful. Uh, where do you live? Well, we're buried up in the woods right now. I'll just drop in here from time to time, see if you've had any luck with them. Mm hmm And I'll take these three brushes. That'll be three dollars. Very well. Here you are. Thanks. Can I wrap them up? No, no, thank you. I'll just put them in my bag. I should be in again by the first of the month. Mm-hmm. Hope I sell them for you. Oh, well, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hmm. Cincinnati. Hey, miss! Miss! Oh. Operator. Operator. Get me FBI headquarters. And you positively identify this photograph, Mr. Weymouth. Yes, that's the girl, all right. Oh, what a fool I was. Her signature is on both these landscapes, Jim. I let her walk right out of here. Did she say she'd return? Yes, she said she'd drop in. I don't think we can wait for that. Uh, gentlemen, I, I wish that there was some way... Mr. To... Weymouth. Yes? These landscapes. Where did she say she'd painted them? Why, uh, right up near their camp. Are you familiar with the country around here? Of course, I know every inch of it. That's... So it makes me so mad if, if she told me where that camp was. I, I think she has. Huh? If these scenes are near her camp, you should be able to recognize them, right? Say, I, I never thought of that. Do they look familiar to you, Mr. Weymouth? Uh, let, let me look at them again. Surely. Here. Say, 
I believe I do know this spot. Yes? She's changed it around some, but... But that's Hibbins Lake. Where's that? It's about 40 miles north of here. Could you take us there? Be glad to. When? Right now. Well, this is the day, honey. Hmm? This is the day I nail that pike. <laughs> Say, he's really got you going. Oh, look, baby. baby. If you spend as much time as I have watching that guy flirt all around the hood. But, darling, aren't there other pikes? Sure, sure there are. But this one is Big Casino. Well, I wish you luck. You want to come out in the boat with me? No. Huh? Mm-mm. I want to finish that watercolor of the hills. How's it coming? Oh, I've changed it about four times. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be running out of paint. Practically. I'll leave the car here, sweetheart. We can walk down to the lake. All right. I'll get your stuff out of the back. Thanks. Oh, what a lovely day. All right, Clinton. Huh? Just keep your hands where we can see them. Arthur. Don't be alarmed, miss. Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. FBI? Nora, hand me that box. Of course. Wait. Would that be Betsy? Yeah. Never mind, honey. <laughs> The trail of a bank robber begins with a description, continues on with a stolen car, leaps across state lines, and ends finally with capture and arrest. Along that trail are clues, good and bad, big and small, right and wrong. The agents of the FBI follow them all. That thoroughness is a great factor in its success. But there is another, a vitally important factor that must never be forgotten. It's in every region, every area, every section of this country local policeman, sheriff, and deputy in the entire nation. That cooperation is invaluable, and it extends beyond to the cooperation of every loyal citizen of this country. That is a formidable opposition. That's a defense to stand up against any criminal. That's a protection which could only be found in a country where the people not only make the law, but are the law. We'll hear about the file on next week's case in just a moment. Will you join the Equitable Society in a salute? A salute to the man on the tractor and to all men who plow the good American earth. Yes, a heartfelt salute to the farmers of these United States. In spite of manpower losses, our hardworking farmers have managed to increase this country's food production by more than one-third. Authorities in England and Russia say that the war might easily have been lost without this extra food raised by America. Today, as it has for many years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is lending the farmer a helping hand. Equitable funds make it possible for thousands of farmers to own their own homes and land and realize that typical American ambition summed up in the words, I want to run my own business. In addition to helping to raise the food that fights for freedom... Equitable funds are heavily invested in other industries which make and transport the weapons of war. Still, other equitable dollars are invested in war bonds. For in wartime, equitable society dollars are fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars. For you, your home, and your country. Next week, a crime against the nation. Espionage. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. Any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Artie Clinton was played by Mandel Kramer. The music was composed and directed by Van Cleave. Your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI, 
is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. Network of the American Broadcasting Company. This is your FBI. This is your FBI an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against our nation, espionage. Nineteen thirty-nine. That year, the continent of Europe already echoed the cries of people under aggression. On the continent of Asia, far beyond our western shores, was Japan, a dedicated nation, a dedicated people dedicated to war upon the United States. But we did not know this yet. Within our western gates were more Japs, thousands of them. Were they dedicated to being good American citizens, or were there among them some dedicated to our destruction? Here was a vital task for the FBI. The safety and security of America might depend on what they found out. A Sunday afternoon in 1939... Two FBI agents from the San Francisco office stood on a pier at the San Francisco waterfront watching a Japanese cruiser warp into the dock. How big would you figure that crowd, Jim? Oh, I'd say, uh, oh, at least a thousand. Pretty excited for Japs, aren't they? Well, this is a big day for them, Larry. It isn't often they get a chance to pay their respects to a big shot from Japan. I know. Larry, is this Prince Suji a member of the royal family? Yes. They sure are giving him the Sunday bows, all right. Funny how they conform to that caste system of theirs. That first line that shook hands with the prince were all top bracket boy. I know, I checked him off. Japanese consul general, head of the Jap Association, leaders of the prefectural groups. Second line was a middle bracket bunch, bankers, nip businessmen. All they got from the good prince was a nod. Well, that's more than the small fry are getting now. There's housewives and farmers. They bow, and the prince doesn't even acknowledge their presence. Hey. Hmm? Look at that bull-necked little man in the chauffeur's uniform. What about him? You notice something? He's not cringing or bowing. He's standing in line with his head up and shoulders back like a soldier. Oh, yes. Hey, did you see that? Yes. The prince bowed to him. I know. I don't like that, Jim. They don't play it that way in their league. Princes don't go around bowing to chauffeurs. Unless our chauffeur is a big shot back in Japan. Yes. That's something you and I better check on. One Jap bowing to another Jap. A pair of striped pants and cutaway coat bowing to a chauffeur's uniform. The two FBI agents, troubled by what they saw, investigated and learned the chauffeur's name and background. Then they took their information to the agent in charge of the San Francisco office of the FBI. That's the story, Mr. Walker. A prince bowing to a chauffeur. That is unusual. Yes. Did you follow this man? Yes, sir. He lives at the Osaka Hotel. His name? Yasu Kajioka. Did you learn anything about his work? Yes, he drives a big Cadillac. He owns it. He runs some sort of escort service with headquarters at the hotel. Anything else on him? 
We found out that he's been a very active worker for many of the local Japanese associations. Well, I think we should do a thorough check on Mr. Kajoka's activities. Won't be too easy. We could use some help. From whom? Someone of his own race. A Japanese who is loyal to us. Well, we might try the university. They have quite a few Japanese-American students there. That's a good idea. Suppose I arrange with the dean of studies out there for you to have a talk with him. Fine. I'll get him on the phone right now. The two FBI agents spent almost an entire day with the dean of studies at the university. They pored over the personal records of many Japanese-American students and finally narrowed down their choice to one man a student by the name of Tom Tanaka. His record showed he lived in the same neighborhood as the Jap chauffeur. Gentlemen, have you reached a decision? Yes, sir. This man, Tom Tanaka, looks good to us. Well, I think you've made an excellent choice. He lives in the same neighborhood as the man we want watched. If he measures up in other ways, that's a definite plus. I understand. You realize, sir, how important it is to us that we be able to trust this boy implicitly? Yes, I do. We've got to know if he's loyal. He's a real American at heart. He thinks and acts like an American. There are thousands of men and women who live here on the West Coast, Mr. Schuyler, who look Japanese and are the sons and daughters of Japanese. But I know them as true Americans. They're as loyal as any of us whose ancestors were German, English, French, Irish, or whatever. I say that this boy is an American just as you or I. Good. Can we meet him at once? Tom, I imagine your dean has told you that we're special agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yes, sir. He has. We've selected you, son, from the list of the entire enrollment of Japanese Americans here at the university. As a student? No. No, as an American. Well, what about it? I am an American. We believe you are, in every sense of the word. Has somebody been talking about me? No. No. Then what's this all about, sir? Tom, we want you to help us. How? In a very important, perhaps very dangerous way. You... You want me to work with the FBI? Yes. Do you know a man called Kajioka? Yasu Kajioka? Oh, yes. We're neighbors. I helped him compose letters in English. Several times. Good. What, do you remember you? I think so. He said once that he might give me a job doing secretarial work in my spare time. Why do you ask me about Kajoka? We need a loyal Japanese-American like yourself to help us investigate this man. We want to know if he is connected with any un-American activities. Hmm. What do you want me to do? Help us to get information. Tom, all we want are facts. I see. You said that you, you know Kajioka. That he offered you a job once. We want you to go to him. Take the job. We're giving you the opportunity to do this as an American, Tom. Well, what would I say to Kajoka? How would I ask for the job? You'd tell him that you're in need of money to finish your studies. If he hired you, you'd undertake at once to impress him with your love of Japan and the Japanese. We don't want you to put your life in danger. You'd be cautious, never inquisitive. What do you say, son? I'll do it. No. What do you want, young man? I want to talk to you, Mr. Kajoka. Uh, uh, what about, please? A job. Why? To earn some money. Why do you come to me, lowly chauffeur, if you need money? You told me someday you might give me a job. Oh, yes. Why you want to earn money? To keep up my studies. You got father, mother. I don't want to ask them. So, but you ask lowly chauffeur, why? Everyone says good things of Kajoka. Oh, oh, good. You hear perhaps I visit cruiser. They say Kajoka was greatly honored. Oh, so, they say correctly. Uh, please, you sit down. Thank you. Oh. Now... How you think? What do you mean? It could be important for me to know. 
I think Japanese. Oh, oh, oh. And what are those thoughts, please? I love my people. I love Japan. So, I think maybe you lie. Why should I? Who can read my thoughts? Oh, very, very good. Yes. Will you give me a job? Yes. You work for me now. Come every day. I'll try to read your thoughts. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yes. Once the all-important inside contact had been made, many FBI agents took up the trail. They learned that Kajioka always drove Japs who were easily identified as high-ranking naval officers on vacation. They learned that he was the head of a secret Jap organization on the West Coast, the Hamusha Kai, boasting over 10,000 members, all eligible for military service in Japan. The society masked itself as a charitable one, Charity in the sense that thousands and thousands of dollars were drafted from the members and sent back to Japan. Why? The answer came quickly and dramatically. One night on a street corner, young Tom Tanaka reported to the special agents of the FBI. Tom. Tom. Yes, sir. Here we are. I haven't much time, sir. I've got to get back. What have you got, sir? Something big is cooking. There's a great meeting called in the basement of the Japanese high school for tonight. Kajoka will make an appeal to get more funds to send back to Japan. I see. Also, they are to show preparedness movies sent over from Japan. Are you supposed to attend this meeting? Yes. Kajoka will expect it. Tom. Yes, sir. We need a list of the members in that organization. Practically everything depends on our getting it. Do you think you could go to the meeting, get the list, and get away alive? Yes. The pictures may go on about 8 o'clock. I'll try and sneak out and meet you here then. Good boy. Good luck. We'll be waiting. We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on Kajioka enemy alien. We will reopen this file in just a moment. Yesterday, Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, received an interesting letter. It was from a member of the Equitable Society, and it read, Mr. Parkinson, just how many businesses is the Equitable Society in anyway? Our radio program talks about millions of equitable dollars invested in war bonds and more millions in key war industries like shipyards and railroads, in oil, steel, and aluminum. Friends tell me how the Equitable Society helps keep kids in school and helps people own their own homes and farms. It all sounds mighty complex to me. Yes, investing the premium dollars of 3,200,000 members of the Equitable Society is of necessity a very complicated operation. For safety's sake, those equitable funds have to be spread out widely, must go into thousands of different enterprises. And yet all this is done to make it easy and simple for equitable society members to attain greater security for themselves and their loved ones. And so you see, by employing its funds in all kinds of activities that are useful to the nation as a whole, the equitable society is able to offer sounder, and safer protection to its members than any one member could achieve by his own unaided efforts. By serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on Kajioka, Enemy Alien. Nineteen thirty nine. In that year there wasn't even a slight buzzing in our ears to warn us that enemy planes were warming up for an attack. There was nothing in the word protocol to make us think of anything but where the wife of some ambassador might have to sit at some state dinner. Yet two men of the FBI standing on a dock at San Francisco had seen in a bit of Jap protocol enough to make their blood run cold. Enough to make them on their own initiative as Americans set up a series of patient, exhaustive, 
dangerous investigations which inched down 1939 through 1940 and brought them on the evening of February 3rd, 1941 to stand tense in a darkened hallway near a high school in the Jap section of San Francisco. Watch it, Jan. Don't let that street light hit you. I've counted about 2,000 have gone into that meeting so far. Still coming. Judge Yoker, still must have passed the word along. What time is it? Almost 7.45. Mm-hmm. Looks like the meeting is getting started. Somebody coming along to see the channel. Pull back here. Tom. Tom. Here. Oh, hello. We've got a wonderful break. Todd Joker forgot to bring the records. He wants me to go to his house and get them and bring them to the meeting. What part of the meeting is on now? They're going to run off to the movie. How long will that take? Until about 9.15. Good. I'll go with you, get the records, bring them to the FBI office. We'll have them photographed and back in your hands by 9 o'clock. Can you do it that soon? We've got to. Jim. Yes? You stay here. Call the office. Tell them what we have to do. Ask for the entire staff to stand by. Right. I'll drive Tom over. It's going to be tight going. I know. This is the first break we've gotten, and it may be the only one. Let's go. While the movies whip the Japanese audience up with blatant pictures of Japan's armed might, while distinguished visitors sat rigidly straight in the front rows, their cropped heads marking them high officers of the Emperor's Army and Navy, while almost 3,000 sons of Nippon shared a new sense of oneness, of dedication to emperor and country, an alerted FBI office brilliant with lights, crowded with 100% staff, worked feverishly to photograph the secret documents and make the deadline. I don't think we can wait any longer, Mr. Logan. It's 8.54. I know. I've got to be back to the hall before the lights are turned up. We'll make it. One minute to deadline. How are you coming? Two more sheets. The others are finished. Come on, then. Hurry it up. Please, you've got to give me the originals. I can't wait. The movie ends at 9.15. Let's start correlating pages in the original. You know how they go, Tom? Yes, sir. I'll grab them as fast as they're finished. Number two is finished. Come on, snap up on number three machine. Please, hurry. Hold an elevator. Right. Here you are. This is the final. Thanks. We'll put them together in the car. It's 8.55. Let's go. We'll just make it. Mr. Kajoka. Where have you been? It took you a long time to get papers. I stood in the back of the hall to see the pictures. I thrilled with the people. Uh, Give me the records. Here you are, sir. Good. I have news. We have received orders to change names of all branch chapters of our organization, and we must at once seem to stop our activities. Why? Why? Because soon, glorious Japan will win honor or downfall. And we are ordered to prepare for duty as soldiers behind the guns. The FBI had everything it needed now on Brother Kajioka. Its position as head of the secret society. Its activity as a chauffeur deluxe for visiting Japanese officers. Its role as collector extraordinary of funds for the Japanese war machine. Its devious role as espionage agent. Everything the FBI needed except the right to go out and arrest him. Under our way of government, we do not go about arresting citizens of friendly nations. The FBI could watch and wait. And to add insult to injury while it fretted over its watching and waiting, one of the FBI agents had reason to phone into the agent in charge of the San Francisco Bureau. Yes? This is Logan. Yes, Larry. Jim and I have been following Kajioka. Yes? We followed him from the Osaka Hotel. He drove straight to Sutter Street. Yeah? Parked his car, proceeded on foot to 111 Sutter Street. Why, well, that's our building here. I know. Well, where did Kajioka go? He's in your foyer, waiting to see you. He's what? Well, thanks, Larry. Bye. Yes? Uh, Mr. Kajioka to see you, sir. Send Mr. Kajioka right in. Mr. Walker? Yes. What can I do for you? I am Kajioka. Sit down, Kajioka. Now, uh, what do you want to see me about? I come to FBI because I am honorable man. I see. 
I wish to offer my services to the United States. Why? I hate Japanese. Oh? Tell me about it. I was born in Japan. One time in Japan, they arrested my father. He was a good man, harmed nobody. They say he was disloyal, but they have no proof, and it is a lie. What happened to him? I never see him again. They murder my father. And so you hate Japanese? Yes, very much. I would be good agent for FBI. What makes you think so? Japanese government tried to get me to work against the United States. You know how it is. You have information on certain secret Japanese organizations here. No? A little. Oh, that is too bad. With me, you get to know much. I know all Japanese tricks. I make valuable agents. Perhaps you would, Mr. Kajoka. You think about it. And remember, I want to work for United States. Great country. I work for FBI and kill many Japs. Well, we're not interested in killing Japs nor anyone else. Sometimes it will be necessary. Then you tell Kajioka what to do, where to go, and he goes. Well, thank you very much for your offer, Mr. Kajioka. We'll take it under consideration and we'll let you know in due time. Thank you. So much. Not at all. It will be a pleasure. Mr. Kajioka might have smelled a rat. That is, if a rat can smell himself. But his surprising offer was politely refused. And his intensified wanderings by day and night were as equally matched by the more intensified watching by the many electricians and workmen. Laundrymen, truck drivers, cabmen, innocent motorists who sent in their reports under the names of special agents of the FBI. Still, all they could do was watch. Watch and follow the little man who was dedicated, like his country, to the destruction of America. Then came December 7th, 1941. On that fateful day... The entire staff of the FBI was gathered in tense silence in each of the Bureau's offices. In San Francisco, even the local law enforcement officers were present, waiting. Waiting. Everyone here? Everyone, sir. Larry, you and Jim can stand by and watch the teletype. Right, sir. The names are coming in from Washington. Names and addresses of enemy aliens to be picked up when the word comes through. We'll take them. I know a name you two will want to watch for. Yes, sir. Thank you. Getting into the case now? Yeah. Hello? Yes, sir. Right. That's the word. Get going. K is in Kajioka. K is in Kajioka. Come on, tell a type. There it is. Capital K for Kajioka, the little rat. We got him now. Come on. Now you see who I am, Major Kajioka. Yes. How do I look in my uniform, Pop? Very well, sir. Yes. No more lowly chauffeur. Glorious Japan has struck. American fleet. No more. Pearl Harbor. No more. All gone. Soon planes come. Then transport. Yes. I have two revolvers, see? Oiled and loaded. I give you one. Soon our soldiers march in the streets. And you and I will go out and kill every dirty American we see. Yes? Yes. Yes. You watch at the window. Tell me when you see planes. Tell me when you see glorious soldiers of our brave army. Ah, I will pour drink for ceremonial pour. Yes, sir. I'll keep watch. Ah, soon I will be colonel. Then general. Wait until you see how they will reward me for what I've done. Ah, I will be big man. Yes, of course. I hear planes. Do you see them yet? Not yet. Listen. Our soldiers are coming. I think to glorious Japan. They are here. Come in. Banzai! Come on, Katioka. Huh? Uncle Sam wants to see you about a place called Pearl Harbor. K 
Hagioka was rounded up with thousands of his kind. Rounded up with the aid of a loyal Japanese-American. Like the rest, Kajioka wondered how the FBI had known of his work. Does he remember that little incident back in 1939 when a pair of striped pants and a cutaway coat bowed to a chauffeur's uniform on the hard deck of a Japanese cruiser? Probably not. He wouldn't understand the things that make Americans tick. The American willingness of those who serve our country in the ranks of the FBI. No, Kajioka probably will never understand until it's too late. And how will he ever know that it was too late that day back in 1939? You'll hear about the disposition of this case in just a minute. On the beaches of Normandy... Our boys were seeing the latest movies 24 hours after landing. And not long ago on a Pacific island, two Japanese snipers were captured when they tried to join a G.I. audience to see an American film. Yes, movies follow the flag because Uncle Sam knows that they're first-rate morale builders for battle-weary men. So will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to the motion picture industry? A salute to the daring cameramen who risk their lives in every American attack. To the technical men who developed special equipment to photograph Tokyo from 45,000 feet in the air. To the actors, musicians, and directors who made tens of thousands of valuable training films for our armed forces. And to the 16,000 theater managers who have sold millions of war bonds in every drive. Members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will be proud to learn that their premium dollars have helped finance this great industry, which has proved such a vital asset to the nation at war. For years, the Equitable Society has invested in the motion picture industry, as well as in other essential American industries and American agriculture. Yes, in wartime, Equitable Society dollars are fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars. For you, your home, and your country. As an enemy alien, Yasu Kajioka was placed in an internment camp to remain there for the duration of the war with Japan. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, Kajioka was played by Ted Osborne. The music was under the direction of Van Cleave, the author was Frank Wilson, and your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. Now the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States brings you a message from the Office of War Information. It may seem slightly ridiculous these hot July days to be thinking of winter heating problems. But actually, it's the most sensible thing you can do. The fuel situation is still critical, so don't put off your heating problems and forget all about them. Check your heating equipment now. Order insulation for the walls, windows, and doors of your home. Talk with your fuel dealer and take his advice. Fill your coal bin or your oil tank right away before the fall rush begins. This is the American Broadcasting Company. 
This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight the story of a crime against society, the confidence game. There are many ways for a thief to steal. There are many forms of larceny. They range from the simplest stick up to the involved manipulations of a big time swindle. This present war period has created a fertile field for the swindler. Increased salaries, increased employment set up a ready market for his get-rich-quick activities. On May 22, 1934, Congress, by passing the National Stolen Property Act, put into the hands of the FBI an effective weapon against confidence men. In spite of this, however, swindlers still pursue their losing game. Their drama is an old one, and it's worked with little variation. Its first act might begin, as this one does, in the office of a respectable businessman. He is greeting a visitor. Sit down, Mr. Perry. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, warm enough for you? I should say so. Phew. You know, I, I thought they called this the Windy City. <laughs> I haven't even felt a breeze since I've been here. <laughs> well, why don't you take off your coat? Well, sir, now, I don't mind if I do. There... Oh, I feel better already. Oh, uh, how long are you planning to be here in Chicago, Mr. Perry? Uh, just long enough to complete my business with you. You mean you came here just for that? Exactly. Well... As I told you in my letter, Mr. Mitchell, this is a really big proposition. Yes, it must be. You're coming on here from New York. Uh, suppose I give you some of the details. Yes, I, I wish you would. Well, as you know, I'm the American representative of British Farm Equipment Limited. Yes, our headquarters, of course, are in London. Oh, I know the firm. My principals ask me to contact you and find out just how much interest you might have in working along with us on a very ambitious post-war program. Here in the States? Yes. Confidentially, we plan to open a factory here as soon as possible. I see. And we'd like you to take charge of the plant. M me? Me take charge? That's right, sir. Why should you be interested in me? Well, we made a complete survey of all men in the farm equipment field. It should flatter you to know, Mr. Mitchell, that your name came out at the very top of the list. You don't say. So that's why I'm here. Well, I, I certainly am flattered. Now, uh, I'm not authorized to close any deal with you. I merely came to sound you out and uh, turn in a report. Of course. Uh, what can I tell the Home Office, Mr. Mitchell? Are you interested? Uh, yes, uh, very interested. Good. Sir Richard Barton, our financial director, is arriving in this country in the next few weeks. Yes? He'll undoubtedly want to get together with you. Can I cable and say that you're willing to talk to him? Of course. Thank you, sir. Well, this has been a very satisfying visit. <laughs> The first act in any swindle must sound completely authentic, must convince the victim, must stand up under any investigation he might make. The facts the confidence man gave regarding the farm equipment company were true, with only one exception. He did not represent the company. His victim naturally did not know this. So several weeks later, in answer to a summons from the swindler, Mr. Mitchell traveled east to meet one Sir Richard Barton at a hotel in Newport, Rhode Island. Some more bread, Sir Richard? No, thank you. 
And how about you, Mr. Mitchell? Uh, I have some, thanks. Uh, what was I just talking about? The patent rights on that tractor, Sir Richard. Oh, yes, of course. We have exclusive rights, you know. The tractors can be produced at an extremely low cost. We can undercut the whole market. You mean here in this country? All over the world, Mr. Mitchell. Well, I, uh, I can tell you confidentially that the British government is interested in our company to quite a large degree. That we don't talk about, though. Of course. Well, frankly, that's the main reason for my visit to America. Oh? I have to contact your State Department on some corporation matters. I'm doing it through our own embassy. I see. I, uh, I may have to ask you to come to Washington with me, Mr. Mitchell. Why? Uh, because of your extensive knowledge of this type of manufacture. You might be called on for some off-the-record testimony. Well, I, I'd like to help any way I can. Bully for you. I had an idea that you might... Uh, yes? Uh, what is it? What's this? What? A wallet. I felt it with my foot. It was under the table. Is it yours, Sir Richard? No, it's not mine. Uh, Mr. Mitchell? No, it doesn't belong to me. Well, what do you think I should do? Look inside, Perry. See if there's any identification. Oh, well, I hate to... Well, then, here, let me have it. Yes, sir. Probably dropped by whoever was dining here. Oh, I say. Look here. What? One thousand dollar bills. Hey. Five of them. Here's an identification card. Lee Jackson, Surf Hotel. He's a guest here. Evidently. Uh, pretty careless fellow. I should say. It's fortunate for him that we were the ones who found it, eh? Uh, yes. Uh, Perry, contact Mr. Jackson. After dinner, have him come to my suite, will you? Answer that, will you, Perry? Yes, sir. Another drink, Mr. Mitchell? No, 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 not right now, thanks. When might we die? Yes? My name is Jackson. Lee Jackson. Oh. You told me at the desk somebody up here found my wallet. That's right. That's right. Come in. Thanks. This is the man who lost the wallet. Oh, uh, how are you, sir? Okay. You're Mr. Jackson? That's right. Well, I have your wallet here. I think for obvious reasons you should identify its company. Sure. Uh, will you check the items, Mr. Mitchell? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, five $1,000 bills. Mm -hmm. Some money order receipts. Uh, yes. Three, I think. Uh, that's right. An Elks card, an address book, two letters, and a racetrack badge in my name. I, yes. I think that's all. Does uh, that tally, Mr. Mitchell? Uh, yes. Yes, it does. Very well. Uh, let him have the wallet. Thanks. Well, you're a very fortunate man, Mr. Jack. Oh, I know it. I... I'd like to do something for you. Oh, that isn't necessary. Look, take this grand and cut it up between you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Jackson, but we're really not interested. Definitely not. Uh, right, Mr. Mitchell? Of course. Well, I got another idea. Yes? This you can't beef about. Look, I'm around racetracks, what you call a betting commissioner. Yes? I'll take this grand and put it on a horse for you. The right kind of a horse. Please, Mr. Jackson. If he wins, we cut up the profits. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, How about uh, it? What do you think, Sir Richard? Oh, I suppose we have to make some compromise with Mr. Jackson. And you, Mr. Mitchell? Well, uh, I have no objection. Okay, gentlemen. It's a deal. Act two of the swindle is always the build-up. The victim is let in on the ground floor is given something for nothing, usually in great abundance. Mr. Jackson, the latest addition to the rapidly growing confidence ring, returned to the hotel suite the following evening. Returned with a $3,000 profit. His confederate suggested that the money be bet again. He agreed to this, and the second horse won, and the profit was $14,000. Another horse was played, and another, until at the end of three days, the trio had a profit of $120,000. As the figures, gentlemen, it's amazing. Amazing. Well, where do we go from here? Well, I... I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Perry? You've got me. Uh, Mr. Mitchell? Oh, 120,000 is a lot of money. Yes, indeed. That's 30,000 apiece. I know, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, can I put in my two cents worth? Oh, by all means, Jackson. Please do. These horses I've been playing weren't exactly stiffs. Naturally, I had to have information. Uh, of 
Cook. And I can just about guarantee you that the information is going to continue. Really? I'm expecting a bookmaker up here. He'll have the payoff money with him. Meantime, do a little thinking for a minute and see whether you want to take one more step. Very well. Look, I don't have to do any thinking. My mind is made up. In which direction, Perry? I'm for playing one more horse. Well, that's very sporting. And by Jove, I, I think I'll string along. Well, I, I still say 120000 is a lot of money. Oh, come now, Mr. Mitchell. After all, we're gambling with their money. Mm, that's true. Well, then, why hesitate? Well, all right. I agree. Capital, capital. That's probably the book. Come in. There's Mr. Jackson. Yeah, uh, come in. Come in. Come in, Frankie. Okay. This is Mr. Perry, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Barton, Frankie Stevens. How do you do, Mr. Stevens? We've been holding a stockholders meeting, Frankie. Uh huh. We just about made up our minds to play 120 grand back with you. Oh, just like that, huh? Now, what's the matter? Well, I come here to have a little talk with you about that 120. Uh, does this mean he's reneging? Now, look, mister, I don't operate that way. I've got your dough right here in this little bag. But first, I've got to find out something. Well? You guys have been getting a free ride. How? Suppose you had lost 120,000. Would I have collected? Well? Well, would I? Well, that's hardly the it's point. It's very much the point, mister. In fact, that's the only way you're going to get your money. What do you mean? Show me 120,000. And I mean cash. Then I'll make my payoff. Now, look, Frankie. That's my deal, to... boys. Now, get it up. After the fourth member of the confidence ring, the bookmaker had departed from the hotel suite, a conference was held. A conference which resulted in the victim, Mr. Mitchell, returning to Chicago accompanied by Perry to negotiate a loan to pay his share of the bookmaker's demands. Now the second act of the swindle has been completed. The victim is primed for the kill. Obtaining $30,000, 30000 in cash, Mitchell and Perry return to Newport, return to the Surf Hotel, return for the final act. Now, let me see. You've given me your 30000 Perry. That's right. I have a draft here for 60000 which was sent to me from New York. I'm uh, putting up Mr. Jackson's share, you know. Yes. And uh, you have your money, Mr. Mitchell? Uh, yes, right here. Splendid. Uh, let me have it, please. Well, what for? Uh, Perry has agreed to go to the bookmaker's establishment. He'll show him our capital and collect our profits. Oh. Oh, oh very well. What about the bet? How's that? I thought we agreed that we we're going to take a stab at one more horse. Oh, of course, Mr. Jackson. Of course, I... <laughs> it completely slipped my mind. Perry will still have to bring the dough to the book. Well, uh, how much are we betting? Our winnings. We don't touch any of this money that we're putting up. This credit money? Of course not, Mr. Mitchell. What's the horse, Jackson? Oh, yeah, here I... I wrote it out in a slip. You play him the place. Uh, is that for second? Yes. Mm. Uh, what's the name of the horse? Why? Well... Shouldn't we know who we're betting on? You know who we were betting on before? Do you know what horses put us 120 G's ahead? No. Jackson's right, Mr. Mitchell. He has more than established his honesty to date. Uh, let me have the money. Very well. Here you are, Perry. I'd better be getting over there. Uh, we'll wait for you here. Good luck, old boy, and good hunting. <laughs> Did they announce any results yet, Mr. Jackson? No. Uh, are you sure you're tuned to the right station? Yeah, yeah, we'll get it any minute now. You know, this is most exciting. Do you agree, Mr. Mitchell? <laughs> yes, uh, a bit nerve-wracking, too. Well, I always say a sporting chance is... Well, a race at Jamaica, off at 321 and a half. The winner, post three, Sun Boy. Is that our horse? No. second, post 11, victory ride. That's us, that's our bet. For show... Well, uh, we won? Yes, sir. We picked him in the right slot, too. Oh. We played him the place. Congratulations, Mr. Jackson. Congratulations. This is wonderful. Should pay better than three to one. Heavens. We've made a fortune. Uh, they come in. Perry, you're just in time. We won, Mr. Yeah. Perry. We won our bet. On the level? Yes. The horse won? No, ran second, but that's good enough for us. Second? Yep. You mean it didn't win? What's the difference? We still collect. Oh, that's... Oh, what's wrong? 
Oh, I... I did a terrible thing, gentlemen. How do you mean? I bet on him to win. You, you did what? what? But you... I told you, Perry... I know, I know, but he was ten to one. I figured you've been lucky right along. Perry, that's disgraceful. Oh, yes, you, you haven't heard the whole story. But what do you mean by that? I... I bet our credit money, too. What? what? Why, you... Wait, don't, now keep away. Jackson, don't. don't stop. Don't. Perry has a very bad heart. Jackson. Oh. Good heavens. Perry. Perry, are you all right? He's unconscious. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, get a doctor, please. Uh, there's one on the second floor. Second floor? Uh, yes, uh, hurry. Uh, very well. All right, boys. Let's blow. momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on the confidence ring. We'll return to this case in just a moment. We Americans must think very highly of life insurance because we buy more of it than all the rest of the world put together. Seventy percent of the life insurance now in force on this globe is owned by citizens of the United States. All of which goes to prove that we Americans believe in self-help and self-reliance. Believe in watching out for our futures. Believe in educating our own children and in taking care of our families. Of the large number of Americans who feel that way, 3,200,000 have joined forces as members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Please take particular note of that word society in the Equitable's name. It means that the Equitable is not a profit-making enterprise, has no stockholders, is entirely owned by its members, that is to say, by its policyholders. Dollars entrusted to the Equitable Society to build security for its members are put to work in ways that benefit the whole country, are invested in homes, farming, and in scores of the key industries on which our national security and prosperity depend. By serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on the confidence ring. The confidence game has an ancient and dishonorable history. Its existence can be traced back to the very beginning of time. Through the years, through the centuries, the pattern has varied, but one element has always remained, the gullible victim. Mr. Mitchell returned to the hotel suite in Newport, Rhode Island, to find that his erstwhile companions had left, had disappeared along with his $30,000. Stunned and bewildered, he returned to his home in Chicago. After a lapse of several days, after carefully thinking out his entire adventure, he decided to tell the whole story to agents of the FBI. Uh, when I finally located the doctor, I brought him right to the suite. To my amazement, I, I discovered that everyone was gone. Including the men who'd been assaulted? Yes, sir. What did you do then, Mr. Mitchell? Well, to tell you the truth, I was too mixed up to do much of anything. Did you inquire for them at the hotel desk, see if they'd checked out? Eventually, yes. They hadn't paid their bill. They'd just left the suite and never returned. I see. I wound up paying for it myself. Now, this money you gave them, the 30000 what were the denominations of the bills? Twenties, fifties, and hundreds. Uh, did you by any chance keep a record of the serial numbers? No, I regret to say I didn't. You see, at the time I... Uh, well, I, I just didn't suspect. I understand. Uh, how did this man who called himself Perry first contact you? He, he wrote to me from New York. Did you keep the letter by any chance? Yes, I have it on file in my office. We'd like to see it. Uh, surely. How accurately do you think you could describe these men? Oh, quite well. I, I'm sure of that. Then suppose you give us the descriptions. We'll send them to Washington, have them checked in the general appearance file. The general appearance file is an excellent example of FBI thoroughness. This file consists of photographs and descriptions of approximately 15,000 outstanding criminals. Special agents for the Identification Division checked this file for information on the confidence ring. 
They remove punch cards of all persons falling into the general classification of the descriptions furnished. They place these cards in a sorting machine, a machine adjusted to sort and finally select by mechanical means cards bearing descriptions similar to those of the suspects. Within a short time, the machine had done its job. Photographs which bore the same numbers as the cards that had been mechanically selected were sent by airmail special delivery to the Chicago field office. Can I stay here for a minute, Russ? Yes, come in, Lou. Right. I've just been with Mr. Mitchell. Had him check over the photographs. Any results? Yes, he positively identified all four men. Good. He really was up against a pretty strong team. Yeah, take a look at them. Very well. The old boy there, the one who calls himself Sir Richard, is one George Willis, an English confidence man. I see. The rest of the gang all have quite impressive records, too. I received a report from the Providence office this morning. The agents did a check at the Newport Hotel. They uncover anything? No, there was no indication as to where the gang had gone. Well, how about Scotland Yard? We heard from them late yesterday afternoon. British Farm Equipment Limited is a legitimate company. How about Sir Richard Barton? Oh, he was financial director of the company, but he died in 1940. Hmm. This gang stayed reasonably close to the facts. Yes. Oh, by the way, Mr. Mitchell gave me that letter he received from the man who called himself Perry. May I see it? Oh, surely. Here you are. Thanks. Take a look at the letterhead. British Farm Equipment Limited. I doubt that it's genuine. New York address. Probably a vacant lot. Yes, but the letter was mailed from New York. I know. If this stationery is faked, it might have been printed there, too. Oh, you're right. Let's send it on to the New York office and find out. A slender lead, a letterhead. A letterhead that might have been set up in any print shop in the country. But the letter had been mailed from New York. So agents in that city were given the assignment of checking with every print and stationery shop in the five boroughs. It was a slow job, a tedious job, a seemingly endless job, but a job that finally brought results. Lou. Yes, Russ? A teletype just came in from New York. Oh, on the Mitchell case? Yes. What's the story? That letterhead really paid off. How do you mean? Well, first of all, they checked the address. You were right on that. It was a vacant lot. Well, that figured. But checking on the print shops really uncovered something. They picked the men up? No, it wasn't that strong. But they did find the printer who'd done the job. He said it was for a man named Phil Renville. He lived in a midtown hotel. I see. The agents went to the hotel, contacted the manager, and found that Renville had checked out just this morning. What a break. Judging by his description, Renville is really Mr. Perry. The hotel manager also revealed that three other men had shared a suite with him. Then they're all still together? It would appear that way, yes. Mm -hmm. Any idea where they went? I believe we have. Good. The hotel manager recalled that Renville had done some business with the transportation desk. So the agent checked there and found that Renville had bought four railroad tickets. Well, we'd better have that train covered. We don't have to. Why not? We're going to cover it ourselves. What? Sir Richard and company are aboard the 20th Century. They're due in Chicago here tomorrow morning. Stretch the legs again, eh, boys? Yeah. Uh, Frankie, you look as if you're still asleep. Yeah, I am. <laughs> this early morning deal is murder. How, uh, how long a wait do we have between trains? A couple hours. Shall we take a stroll about town? We'd better get over to the other station first. Other station? That's where the chief leaves from. Oh. We ought to get our bags over there. Very well. Uh, Mr. Perry. Uh, huh? Uh, Mr. Perry. It's the ump chain. Good heavens. Hello there, Mr. Perry. Sir Richard. Greetings, old boy. Mr. Mitchell. Well, this is a ten strike. You've no idea how worried we've been about you. Uh, about me? Yes. What in the world ever happened to you? Oh, whatever happened to my $30,000? Well, you already know that. I mean, what really happened to it? Look, yes. Sir Richard, uh, yes? we're, uh, we're wasting time. We have to make that train. I think you should answer yes. Mr. Mitchell's uh, question, huh? gentlemen. Uh, uh, who, uh, who are you, sir? We're special agents of the FBI. What? What? Just stay together, all of you. May I ask a question? Yes. What is it? Where can we dispose of four tickets on the cheap?
The swindler's drama is an old one, and it's worked with little variation. Its three acts are the meeting, the build-up, and the payoff. But since 1934, since the passage of the National Stolen Property Act, the FBI has been able to add a convincing finish, a finish that was not in the swindler's script. This finish is apprehension and arrest. Confidence men, as well as all criminals, are a blot on the American way of life. Special agents of the FBI will continue to ferret out these individuals, and with cooperation of the public and law enforcement agencies, bring them to justice. You'll hear the disposition of tonight's case in just a moment. Will you join the Equitable Society in a salute? A salute to a man so familiar to you that you tend to forget how important his wartime services are. A salute to the hard-working merchant who runs your corner store. Yes, your butcher, grocer, druggist, and the other small but important businessmen on America's main streets deserve an overwhelming vote of thanks. In spite of shortages, point rationing, and manpower difficulties, they're still doing business at the same old stand. Still proving that in a land of opportunity, the right kind of men can always get ahead. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is proud of its many associations with these typically American institutions. And we firmly believe that the millions of dollars of Equitable Society funds that help finance business may truly be called investments in victory just as are the other equitable millions that have gone into war bonds and war industries. In wartime, equitable society dollars are fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars for you, your home, and your country. In tonight's case, a federal grand jury convening in Boston indicted Barton, Perry, Jackson, and Stevens. They were tried, found guilty, and sentenced to eight years in a federal penitentiary. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Van Cleave. Your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is Infantry Day. A day dedicated to the doughboy, the footslogger, the indispensable soldier who storms enemy beaches, knocks out pillboxes, meets the foe face to face and hand to hand. No war was ever won without infantry, and no infantry ever surpassed the heroic American troops we honor now. But remember, they can't reload their weapons with words of praise. So be practical about Infantry Day. Cheer G.I. Joe and his leaders by giving them ample material aid for the tremendous task ahead. On Infantry Day and every day, buy war bonds in the seventh war loan drive. This is the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>